nā koutou katoa. I te taha o tōku mana, ko inga rangi tiwi. I te taha o tōku papa, ko hikurangi me mō te tau ngā maunga, ko taiki rau ki tau mārere me ramarama ngā awa, ko ngā toki matawaurua te waka, ko ngā tihine, me ngā puhi, me ngā tifatua, me ngā tikahu, me te rarawa me tau pauri o kuiwi, ko te oro wai me ngā ti te tarawa o ku hapu, ko mō te tau te marae, ko sem hinari tōku ingoa nō reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Uh, kia ora everybody, my name is Sam Hinari and I go to a church called King's Church which is based in uh, a city called Purirua which is in the greater region of Wellington in New Zealand. Uh, on the side of my mother I am from the UK, I was born in England. On the side of my father I am Māori. The mountains that I belong to are Hikurangi and Mōtutau. The rivers that I belong to are the Taiki, Rauki, Tau, Marere and the Ramarama. The waka or the boat that brought my ancestors to New Zealand was called the Ngātoki Matawaurua. Uh, the tribes that I belong to, the iwi I belong to, are Ngāti Hine, Ngāpuhi, Ngāti Whātua, Ngāti Kahu, Te Aupauri and Te Rarua. And the sub-tribes or the hapu that I belong to are Te Orawai and Ngāti Te Tarawa. And uh, the marae or the my place of belonging in New Zealand is a place called Mōtutau. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about in this video is we're going to be looking at the main theme being how we contextualise the gospel to reach Māori in New Zealand. Uh, now, on that topic, I just want to say before we start, is this is something that we're still learning, we're not experts in, we're making heaps of mistakes, but we're doing our best because we really want to see Māori saved, and we really want to see this the, the Māori culture, just see God's work throughout it, and how God has made the Māori culture to be this amazing culture, we just want to see it blossom and bloom, um, which... Uh, at the moment in New Zealand, Māori are actually really struggling. So we're going to be talking about contextualising there. Um, the other thing we're going to be talking about just to, for a little bit to start with is just looking at history a little bit, just for a few minutes, just to kind of give some kind of background to what we're saying. Because uh, if we're going to be talking about contextualising the gospel, you need to know just a tiny little bit. And Māori in general are a, are a whakapapa people, a people of whakapapa, which means a people of genealogy. And genealogy and history are a really important part of what makes somebody Māori. So we do need to kind of talk about that a little bit as well. So we'll go through that and I hope you're going to enjoy it and, and take something away from this. Okay. So the English, when they came to New Zealand, they arrived in the late 1700s, early 1800s, and they were who brought Christianity with them. We do see signs of spirituality and, and bits and pieces before they came, but um, it was the English who did bring Christianity here. Uh, they came, we got amazing sermons that happened, uh, but unfortunately the gospel didn't really take off straight away. For about 40 years, you didn't really see any Māori become saved. You saw maybe two or three, but not a whole lot. Then the main founding document that we have in New Zealand is called Te Tiriti o Waitangi, or the Treaty of Waitangi. And that was quite a unique document in the, in the history of the world, because what it was, it was a document that made a treaty between the English and also the Māori. Now, what this, which, and this had never been done before, because we know that the British Empire went through the world just, you know, wreaking havoc on the world and destroying culture, destroying language, all kinds of horrible things. But this, in this document, we see Māori and English come together in a way to try and live together without one culture dominating the other or without one culture walking over the top of the other. Or that was what the treaty or the document was supposed to be. Uh, unfortunately, a few weeks after this document is signed, or a few days, few weeks after it was signed, we see that English, or a, a few of the high up English people, they begin to steal land from Māori. And all of the Māori land pretty much goes. It's really a really sad story, a story which we've seen repeated through history in different parts of the world where the British Empire went. Now, Māori are a people who are really attached to land, really attached to the, what's called whenua, and this was a really hard thing. And we actually still see the effects of this land loss today because it's not just, it's a loss of land and a loss of culture. And we see these effects that are played out in New Zealand still today. So I've got a few statistics so for you just to kind of reiterate what some of those uh, those losses are. So we can see that Māori uh, make up 16.5% of the population of New Zealand. And New Zealand's a very small country. Remember, there's uh, I think we've just had about 5 million people now in New Zealand, but 16.5% of the population are Māori. The, the male prison population in New Zealand, 58% is Māori. The female is 51% are Māori. So remember, 16.5% of the nation are Māori, yet they make up over 50% of the prison population. Uh, more Māori smoke. 
they're three times more likely to have gambling problems. Māori are twice as high to get heart disease. Māori are between 1.5 and 2 times more likely to have a stroke. And Māori are more likely to die of cancer. So we see these really horrible negative statistics go uh, are still carried on through New Zealand today, uh, showing what uh, the impact that was felt during that land loss. But as despite all that happening after the Treaty of Waitangi was signed, uh, we begin to see more Māori come through into Christianity, which is really exciting. I think it was estimated at one point that over 60% of the Māori population were attending church, which is really exciting. And we see some amazing figures come through uh, into Christianity and be, being saved into that. We have a man called Katu or Tamihana Taraipuraha. Now, you may... You, May have heard of Taraipuraha, you, hopefully you would have heard of the All Blacks. And the All Blacks, before ever they play a game of rugby, they do a haka. And the man who wrote the haka was Taraipuraha. So his son was one of the main Māori missionaries at the time. So uh, God really began to move through Māori communities, which was really exciting. However, unfortunately, although God, uh, the gospel is moving and impacting and influencing different parts of the Māori community, there is one thing that gets in the way of that. And uh, unfortunately... <laughs> The thing that gets in the way of the gospel continuing to spread is actually the church itself. You see, although we have these amazing upcoming Māori leaders, the church at the time said, the only way you guys are going to be able to become vicars or bishops or whatever it is, or have some kind of status within the church, it was the Anglican church of the time, they said, then you need to learn how to speak Latin. Which, you know, it doesn't say anywhere in the Bible that you need to be able to speak Latin to be a, a church leader or anything like that, but... What it was, it was these self-imposed, or it was these imposed laws, which were actually cultural laws and not biblical laws. And these were put onto Māori, and Māori had, was saying, "Well, we've actually just learned how to speak English. Now you want us to learn how to speak Latin? You know, that's not going to happen." And it put a whole load of people off. You know, it's so sad to think that the one thing that got in the way of the gospel spreading in this nation in the in the early days was the church itself. And unfortunately, that's a theme that we continue to see throughout New Zealand as we see many Māori who are going to churches or try to go to churches, but the churches themselves are very Western-style churches. Not that that's wrong, but there's some big cultural clashes that happen there. And many Māori really struggle and to actually kind of get hooked in because they're done in such different ways. You see, for much of the Western church and for much of the Western world, it's very focused on uh, individualism as opposed to groups. And the Māori culture is very focused on groups and family whānau and how that all works and, and, and interacts. And so for many Māori who come to a, a Western church within New Zealand, that's some of the things that they really struggle with. Other things that are a really big struggle for Māori to come into Western church is that there's a lot of judgmentalism from the Western church towards Māori and towards the Māori culture. And a lot of that actually comes from just not understanding or not knowing, which is really, really sad because it means that as soon as there's something that people don't understand, they judge it and hate on it, and it's really hard. So I remember one time I was uh, looking at this one really amazing website, this amazing prayer website where it had prayers for every country in the world. And, and the, the prayers were great. It would show this little video about the country and would lead us, uh, and the video would then lead in a, into a time of prayer, which was really great. Um, However, I thought, oh, okay, these are really good. Let me have a look at the one for New Zealand, for Aotearoa. So I look at it, and the, it starts off really good. The prayers are amazing. But then the person who is praying, what he says is he says, let me pray against the evil demonic spirits or something like this, against the, the demonic worship that is happening in New Zealand. And what it showed in the video was it showed a Maori welcoming um, ceremony. So it actually had nothing to do with anything what he was talking about. And it's, it's a, a real big shame. I just, I, my heart just broke in that moment. And I just thought, man, there's just so much judgmentalism from uh, many uh, Westerners in New Zealand who just don't understand the, part of the Maori culture and so decide to judge it. I don't know if you know, but Maori meeting houses, uh, they're called Whanau. And inside Whanau, you have these amazing, amazing carvings. Uh, often the carvings represent the ancestors or the family, the whanau of the tribe, of the people who live there. And I've been in meetings where I've heard people say, oh, but those are demons up the wall and false gods up the wall and all this. And it's just really hard because the, these are coming from Christians who come in and just start judging cultures. And imagine what it would feel like to be from that culture to then have to join into this church and be told pretty much you have to renounce your whole culture because to be a Christian means you have to look like a, a Westerner as opposed to looking like a Maori. And it's really hard. And 
Uh, so many people from throughout the years have told stories about how they've had to cast the Maori demons out of people. And it's really sad that it was like that. And many of these people are now repenting, going, man, we got that so wrong. And now, which is really exciting, is we're beginning to come into a time of change where people are saying, uh, look, we got it wrong in the past. We've judged the Maori culture. We've done all these things wrong. Um, but now we just want to uplift them, really, because we want to see those negative statistics turned around. And a way that we can do that is by honouring Māori and actually look for the good in them as opposed to looking for the bad and the negatives. Because you can always find negatives in whoever you want to judge. Um, remember, there are so many uh, negatives about Western culture as well. Um, so it's really exciting to see people begin to look for the good. And when we begin to look for the good in Māori culture, we find so much amazing things. Because Māori actually have so many similarities to like Old Testament Judaism. So it's really cool to, and, and Māori, it's really cool to be able to see and get a better understanding of the Old Testament using a Māori uh, worldview lens. So that's a really exciting place to be. So in our church in Wellington in New Zealand, we are trying to find different ways in which we can contextualize the gospel so that it becomes a lot more alive and a lot more accessible to Māori. So some of the ways that we've been doing that is we've been telling um, Pūrākau or Paki Waitara, which are stories, uh, stories that are based from truth and stories that are more mythological stories. And so we've been trying to weave the gospel through some of these stories because these stories are really built, uh, embedded into Māori people. So one of the stories we've been telling is a story called Te Wetinga, which means the separation. And it's a Māori creation story. It tells the story between Ranginui, who is the Sky Father, and Papatua Nuku, who is the Earth Mother. And at the beginning, according to the story, Ranginui and Papatua Nuku were locked together in this embrace. They were husband and wife locked together like this. And uh, they were in this perfect embrace, completely in love. And it says that their bonds were so close and they were in such close connection with each other that they were even kind of growing into each other and growing towards each other at the same time. So it was such a close and tight embrace. However, in the middle of that embrace, they had seven sons. And their seven sons got a bit fed up of sitting inside the, in between Ranginui and Papatua Nuku because it was all cramped up and squashed for them in the middle there. So what happened was one of their sons, a guy called Tane Mahuta, he put his shoulders to the ground onto Papatua Nuku and his legs up into the sky into Ranginui and he pushed and pushed and he separated Rangi and Papa and Tane Mahuta was to become the god of the forest and so it's the trees that are there to separate the sky from the land. So we begin to tell this story and we begin to say well actually that close relationship that was had between Ranginui and Papatua Nuku that was the relationship that we were always destined to have with God. And we can look back through Genesis and we see how Adam and Eve walked with God in the garden and how they had this really close and intimate relationship with him. However, as I'm sure we all know, the story goes, Adam and Eve sinned or from our own sin, it got in the way of us having that amazing, perfect relationship and it separated us from God. In the same way that Tane Mahuta separated Ranginui and Papatuanuku. However, then we begin to tell the amazing story of the gospel about Jesus dying on the cross for our sins in a way that we can then be, uh, instead of being judged for the things that we've done wrong, but we get judged as perfect and judged that God looks at Jesus and his perfection instead of us and our sin. And we begin to say, well, actually, well, instead of the son who came to separate in, this, in the case of the story of Rangi and Papa, we had the son, Jesus Christ, the son, he didn't come to separate, but he came to bring us together and back into that perfect relationship. Now, when we begin to tell stories like this, I mean, first of all, when we begin to tell the story of Rangi and Papa or Rangi Nui and Papa Tuanuku, many Māori are a bit amazed at first that we begin to tell the story. Why is this story being told in a church? But then for many people, for many Māori people to see that God has kind of weaved ways and weaved himself into these stories as ways to pull Māori people towards him and to let Māori people look towards him, you th see people go, wow, this was there was always a way for us to look at God and begin to see these eyes begin to light up and people get really emotional when we begin to tell these stories because it's such a, uh, an intense part of them uh, because they get told these stories growing up, uh, told these stories to be able to teach them things and have an understanding of the world. So to be able to see these stories come to light, um, be sent to see these stories being told in a way that is infused with the gospel is actually really stirring. And many times we've told this, we've had Māori crying throughout the services as we've begun to, to, begun to tell these pūrāka or these pakiwaitara, which is really exciting for us. 
other ways in which we try to contextualize the gospel in, in Wellington in New Zealand is we're trying to use key Maori concepts to get things across as well because Maori have many powerful words which are very different and words that you won't find in the English language so we start trying to use these words and weave the gospel through these concepts because they're amazing powerful words so for example one of these words is the word tūranga waiwai tūranga meaning uh, stand, to stand and waiwai meaning feet so let me just read what that means off uh one of the websites that it says here, I've got the computer just below here. It says, Tūranga Waiwai is one of the most well-known and powerful Māori concepts. Literally, Tūranga standing place in Waiwai feet. It is often translated as a place to stand. Tūranga Waiwai are places where we feel especially empowered and connected. They're our foundations, our place in the world and our home. So what we try and say is when we try and weave the gospel into that is we actually say, well, Jesus is our Tūranga Waiwai. Jesus is what we want those things to be. So it says Tūranga Waiwai are places where we feel especially empowered and connected. And we understand, and by looking at that, this is understanding that we have of Jesus, that Jesus gives us power, that Jesus is our place of connection. Jesus says, you can only come to the Father through me. So Jesus is our connection. It says that a Tūranga Waiwai is our foundation. And in the Bible, we hear that story about the man who builds his house on the sand and the man who builds his house on the rock. And we understand that if we build our house, our build our lives on Jesus, then that is our solid place to be. And it says that he's our place in the world and he's our home. Now, we might travel across different nations, different countries, different places. But when we come and we stand before God and we can worship in these different places, there's a real feeling of home, knowing that he's made his home inside us. And that even though we can be in completely different areas, there's a real feeling of coming home when, it can, when we come to worship, when we come to pray and we come to be with God. So by understanding this word Tūranga Waiwai, we get such an a amazing view of who Jesus is. And so we began to try and use some of these uh, concepts, these key Māori concepts, to try and weave the gospel through those to gain a greater understanding. And it really, it, it really fleshes things out for us as well and makes things really exciting. And it shows the power of language and of the Māori language especially. Another way which we contextualise, uh, try and contextualise the gospel for Māori is we write songs. And we write songs that are in the Māori language. Now, uh, we, as I've mentioned before, we talked about key concepts. And so when we're writing songs that are in the Māori language, we're not just writing Western words, but like translating them into Māori or Western ideas or concepts and translating them into Māori. But we're trying to use these Māori concepts. And uh, because if we are, are doing that, it just loses the point. What's the point in us writing a song from a Western worldview, but in a different language? There's no, we don't gain anything from doing that. Uh, so as I mentioned before, we're even using the word Tūranga Waiwai we use in songs. But also we've been using Whakatauki in songs as well. Now Whakatauki uh, Proverbs. So we wrote this one really great song. And uh, in the bridge of this song, we use a Whakatauki or a proverb. And the proverb says, Ko hinga te tōtara i te Which means the great tōtara tree that has fallen in, the, in, this, in this big forest. Now, what that whakatauki refers to normally is it talks about if someone of prominence or someone of high status uh, passes away. It refers to them as this tōtara tree that falls down. And when it falls down, the, just the powerful effect of that fall is kind of felt throughout the rest of the forest. So if we're talking about a person of status, when they pass away, that loss is felt throughout the rest of his iwi or his tribe and, and throughout the rest of the nation. So we use that in this song. We talk about how Jesus has fallen, like the Jesus fell like this great tūtara and the amazing, the intense impact that that was felt throughout the rest of the world. And then we go on to change it a little bit at the end to say, because we can't really just leave it that Jesus has fallen, but we then go on to say, but now he is alive and he is reigning again. And we try and use these concepts, these whakatauki, just as a way to uh, let Māori know that we care, that God cares and God loves them as well. And it's exciting because... After we wrote this song, as soon as we'd finished it, we played it for the first time through, I was sitting there super nervous to see how people were going to react to it. But as soon as we finished, we had this beautiful Māori lady with her um, with her tattoos on her face. Um, and she responded with this amazing prayer in te reo Māori, in the Māori language. And I remember just listening to her prayer and thinking, yes, this is what it is about, about seeing Māori feel that they can be, like seeing Māori in a place where they feel that they can be themselves, that they don't have to conform to a Western way of doing things, but that she can just stand out and pray in her language. And I just thought, man, this is beautiful. This is this is why we do it. It's worth because we want to see them honoured, see these people honoured and lifted up 
in that place to see those negative statistics completely change around. Another really powerful moment was we had, at the end of one meeting, we had one man come forward to the worship leader because we, although we do write some of our own songs in Te Reo Māori, we also translate some songs as well, uh, some more popular or well-known Christian songs. And we'd done a few of these translations and we had one Māori man come up to us or go up to the worship leader at the end of the meeting and he said, coming to your church makes me feel proud to be Māori. And when I heard that, I just thought, Wow, because there are so many places in New Zealand where they are putting Māori down and it, people like not letting them feel proud to be Māori. So for him to come to the church, which is often seen of as this Western institution, to come and feel that his culture has been edified and lifted up, I just thought, wow, you know, this is why we do what we do, to see them lifted up, that they can go away feeling more Māori and, and proud to be Māori, knowing that God has made this amazing culture and put so much into them as a people and that they don't need to completely change their culture around to be Christian. So it's a really beautiful thing to see. The last point I want to make is how that we've seen Te Reo Māori or the Māori language make other nations or other people from different nations really feel at home amongst us as a church. So for example, one time during a worship meeting, somebody was leading worship and just as it was getting to the end of the worship, they began to sing this one song out that were translated into Reo Māori and they began to sing the little bit at the end, the last chorus in Māori. And so, you know, not thinking much of it, just as a way to wrap up the end of the of the meeting or the end of the worship, began to sing it out and then pretty much was going to go and put the guitar down. But then what we heard was a Zimbabwean lady in our crowd as she began to sing out in Shona. We had a Dutch lady in the congregation begin to sing out in Dutch. We had a Cambodian person begin to sing out in Khmer. And all of a sudden, all these different languages began to uh, be sung out, the same, uh, the same words from this chorus. And all of a sudden, it was suddenly like Revelation 7 of every tribe and every tongue around the throne singing out. And it was really exciting to see because using Te Reo Māori, what it did is because it's a minority language, minority in the fact that it's not very, not many people speak it in our church, it began to encourage all those who have minority languages of their own, which are their own home languages, and encourage them to sing it in their own. And that was really exciting because our goal of a church, although we really want to see Māori uplifted, we want to be a tūranga waiwai for everybody from every nation. So we want people, if you're Zimbabwean, we want you to come and feel at home amongst us. If they were Mongolian, come and feel at home amongst us. If you're Khmer, come and feel at home amongst us. You know, we really want people from different nations to feel more like their nation when they're amongst us than when they're not. So come amongst us. If you're Zimbabwean, we want you to feel more Zimbabwean amongst us than not. We want you to feel more Mongolian amongst us than not. Because we know that the church isn't just supposed to look in one particular way like this Western church and this Western style of doing things. But we know that we can see throughout the globe all these amazing cultures that God has created and these amazing ways of worshipping, these amazing ways of praying out and different things like that. And that is what we want to see in our church because that is what in the end we will begin to see this Revelation 7 of all tribes and all tongues around the throne worshipping. And that is just the most amazing and beautiful picture that we can have and that we can aim to be. Okay, so that's all I really wanted to share uh, for this video. Ngā mihi nui ki a koutou, aha koa he tino pōtō i tēnei kiriata, ko tōku tūmana ko he paunami mō koutou. Although this has been a short 20 minute video, it is my hope that this video has been precious and valuable and that there are some things in it that you can take out, learn from and, and hopefully be useful in different contexts. Ngā mihi anō, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou.